And good afternoon and a very warm welcome to Daring Live, where we once again host the Steve Martin Banjo Prize 2023 this time around. David Bandrowski, my co-host, is here as always. How are you, David? I'm great. It's great to be here and great to be able to host this once again. It's an honor. It really is. And it's so much fun. It's a, it's a pretty big, much more involved show than we normally do. And so it's a, it's a, it's a lot of fun getting everything ready and uh, pulling all the strings. And, and it's Allison's really good at not telling us who the winners are until she absolutely has to tell us. <laughs> exactly. And so it's uh, the suspense is, is always fun and, uh, and, and excellent. So, uh, but thank you to everyone uh, for joining us, whether you're joining us li uh, live now, there's a lot of you tuned in. Thank you very much. Uh, or whether you're going to be watching this after it's aired uh, this afternoon uh, and beyond. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the show. Um, we've got a lot of things to discuss and, We've got two very fine and very deserving winners uh, to uh, to acknowledge uh, during the course of this show. For those of you who are new to Daring Live, uh, this is our 99th episode with the 100th coming next week uh, with our, our friend Jens Kruger. But for now, episode 99 is dedicated purely to the Steve Martin Banjo Prize. Um, but you can go to daringbanjos.com slash daringlive if you want to watch any of those other 98 episodes and beyond. Uh, we invite all manner of banjo guests to talk about uh, all things banjo. It is purely a banjo show. Um, we've had a lot, a lot of good people over the years, right? Yeah, we've, it's, it's been fun. It's, we've you know, done the whole gamut of banjo players, you know, you know, yeah. five claw hammer, bluegrass, uh, you know, some four string and uh, six string. Yeah. It's always fun. It's always fun. Well, before we get into the show, um, I think uh, this is not just going out to our normal channels. This, uh, we do have to acknowledge and thank uh, a number of our streaming partners. Uh, so I would personally like to thank, obviously, Compass Records, Freshgrass, IBMA, Folk Alley, No Depression, and then, of course, uh, Daring Live. Thank you to everyone taking part. All right, now, there's not just two of us today. No. <laughs> there's not. There is a third special guest. <laughs> but we all know who she is. Let's bring her in, our good friend, uh, Ms. Allison Brown. Hey, Allison. Hey, guys. Nice to see you again for our, our annual you. tradition here. It's kind of become that, hasn't it? I quite like it. Yeah, I quite it's, like it, too. It's a little later in the year than it has been, but I think... Uh, I quite like it. It's a, it's a very nice way to wrap up uh, what's been a pretty pretty intense year this year. But uh, I think it's going to be a good show. How are things with you? Um, can you remind uh, the viewers at home like what the Steve Martin Banjo Prize is all about? Uh, give us a, a very brief history lesson on that one. Sure. Well, the potted history is that the prize was started by Steve in 2010. And after a decade uh, during which he gave out 10 awards, we decided to reconfigure the prize a little bit and um, expand it to include banjo styles from across the banjo community. So not just five string banjo, which had been the focus of the prize initially, but also to incorporate four string banjo and plectrum styles, tenor banjo, Irish styles, as well as claw hammer and, and three finger five string banjo. So now it truly, um, it truly embraces all styles of banjo. Absolutely. I mean, last year we had uh, Emma Skyhill was one of the winners, uh, Irish tenor player. The year before that, Don Vappi uh, was one of the winners. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's been really, really good to kind of reach out to that, uh, the whole the whole cross section of the banjo community and, uh, and acknowledge everyone. Yeah, How are I, you, though? I'm doing great. I mean, I'm always yeah. excited for the, the, the unveiling of the Steve Martin Banjo Prize winners. And for me as a banjo player, I think it's really exciting to see um, how much musical kinship we share as a five-string banjo player myself with, for example, a four-string banjo player like our, our first winner is and realizing that, you know, it's just the tuning of one string and one extra string that I have that she doesn't have. And otherwise, we're just, you know, musical cousins, not that far separated. So it's always exciting. Yeah, no, it is. And uh, it's you're absolutely right. And Dave, Dave, you're one of those guys that can play back and forth, five-string claw hammer, three-finger style, but you're also a tenor guy as well like you're a, you're a jazz tenor guy and um must feel pretty good having that part of the banjo world recognized as well definitely definitely it's good to bring you know the whole community together because sometimes we get kind of separated in our own spaces but uh it's good good to bring it all into one space 
Are there times, Alison, when you and let's say our first winner this evening, or, or anyone from that scene, do they, is there ever a crossover, uh, different events, or anything like that, or are they are they very very separate? For the most part? Um, there isn't as much as I think there should be. But um, for example, at the American Banjo Museum, when um, I was inducted a few years ago, I had a chance to play with a bunch of great four string banjo players. And it just, mm. um, I've always loved jazz and especially early jazz. And so to hear the lines that they play, um, it's just completely yeah. really relatable and something that we can kind of apply to the five string banjo too. So I find it really exciting. And I, I hope that this prize will inspire people on both sides of the banjo fence to collaborate with each other more because there's so much musical common ground and it's super fun to explore it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree with you. Very good. Well, uh, we're already uh, a few minutes in here, so it's probably about time to uh, find out who our winners are. Um, only one man that can really do that job, and that is Mr. Steve Martin himself. Let's, uh, let's hear what he has to say. Hi, I'm Steve Martin, and I am honored and proud to introduce this year's winners of the Steve Martin Banjo Prize. This year, we honor masters of both the four-string banjo, the original fretted instrument of jazz, and the five-string banjo, the defining instrument of bluegrass. Now, in addition to their live performances and recordings, both winners have furthered the legacy of the banjo through their work as band leaders and educators, inspiring a generation of banjo players in the process. The 2023 winners are four string plectrum banjoist Cynthia Sayer from New York City and the Duke of Drive five string master Terry Bauckham from Elkin, North Carolina. And sadly, uh, Terry passed away after we had determined the prize, uh, he was told of his win uh, before he passed away and we, we heard that he was extremely pleased. So Terry, uh, we'll miss you and you are a great, great contributor to the Five String Banjo. So thank you very much. And thanks for everything all of you do for the banjo. <laughs> All right, Cynthia Sayer and Terry Bockham, the winners. It's yeah. a great selection and obviously kind of shrouded with uh, some sorrow and some, and some grieving at the same time, but um, it deserved uh, both, a pair, both, um, I think. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll explore that as we go. Um, but uh, reactions? Well, I mean, both of these winners have a, a big place in my heart. Of course, Terry Bauckham was a huge influence as I was learning to play. And even as I continued on, I mean, there's nobody with a right hand like Terry Bauckham. And um, that uh, Boone Creek record, One Way Track, I, I think I, I know every note on that record. So that's huge. And then for me as a female banjo player, just seeing one of my uh, sisters in the banjo get recognized this year is, is very meaningful. Yeah. Dave? Yeah, it's, it's, they're both extremely well deserved. I've been influenced by both of them for since I've been playing um, both both different styles, bluegrass and, and four string, you know, jazz banjo, and uh, it's it's great that they're both well recognized and it's very deserved. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think uh, you know, you, Alison, you do a lot um, in particularly. You mentioned uh, the females of. Uh, of bluegrass in particular, do you, I think it's probably time to get a crossover going with uh, with Cynthia, right? Come I hope on. so. I look forward to it. That would be fun. Yeah. Let's let's make that happen. I think uh, get her into the fold there. So I think let's uh, let's meet her. Let's um let's we'll kick off with a little uh, a little video here, and then we'll we'll bring in uh, Cynthia for a bit of a chat. What do you think? Let's do yeah. it. All right. <laughs> Cynthia Sayer is a pioneer among four-string banjo players. Praised for her drive and virtuosity by the New York Times, as an instrumentalist, vocalist, band leader, she is renowned for bringing the swinging sounds of jazz banjo, the original fretted instrument of jazz, to concert and festival audiences worldwide. A member of the American Banjo Hall of Fame, Cynthia is the first four-string banjoist to appear on the cover of the Musicians Union official publication, International Musician Magazine and the first four-string jazz banjoist to be a featured artist at the iconic Newport Jazz Festival. 
Cynthia started playing at age 13 when she received a banjo in lieu of a drum kit from her parents. She recalls coming home from school and seeing it on her bed. I knew immediately it was a bribe, she says. I remember accepting that I'd never get my drum set and thinking, okay, I might as well try playing this thing instead. She lists historic jazz banjoist Elmer Snowden's album Harlem Banjo as an early pivotal influence, describing the album as an epiphany in the way it showcased the four-string banjo's powerful rhythmic drive and dynamic articulation as ideal for jazz. Cynthia rose to international prominence as a founding member of Woody Allen's New Orleans Jazz Band. She has gone on to play with a long list of legendary musicians, including Wynton Marcellus, Bucky Pizzarelli, Les Paul, and Marvin Hamlish. She has performed at the White House and Lincoln Center and has done educational programs for both Lincoln Center and Jazz at Lincoln Center. Cynthia is also an avid educator and has taught at the Berklee College of Music and the New School, among others. At the core of her artistry is Cynthia's belief in the power of music to bring people together, regardless of cultural or political differences. She says, I consider my basic job as a musician to be all about connecting people to a joyful, engaging experience. We are proud to award this year's Steve Martin Banjo Prize to Cynthia Sayer. Here to share a few words of congratulations is Woody Allen. Hi, I just want to congratulate Cynthia Sayers because she played with me for years and we had a wonderful time playing together in my band and now she's being honored and I think it's very well deserved. So I just wanted to say congratulations to her and good luck, Cynthia, with uh, the award and with the rest of your banjo life. (laughs) Hey, Cynthia, congratulations. Oh, that was a nice surprise. (laughs) (laughs) hi thank you very much (laughs) well you're it's so well deserved uh you know i've been i've been a a fan of yours since i've been playing the four string banjo and uh and uh so it's really well deserved and and good to see good to see uh somebody from from the four string world you know winning the award um well thank you would you like to play a tune for us to kind of kick this off oh right off the bat sure um Well, let's see. Here's a tune that probably every concert we sound check to. (laughs) I know why I've waited. Know why I've been blue. Prayed each night for someone who's exactly like you. Why should we spend money on a show or two? No one does those love scenes exactly like you. You make me feel so grand. I want to give the world to you. You make me understand each foolish little scheme. I'm scheming and dreaming, dreaming. 
taught me to be true She meant me for someone who's exactly like you Just exactly like you Yeah, sounds great Thanks So uh, how'd you get first get interested in the banjo and what drew you to the plectrum banjo? Well, I actually wasn't interested in the banjo <laughs> at all. I, I wanted to get a drum set. I, as a kid, I, I played a number of different instruments. My main instrument was piano, actually. And, you know, I had a guitar and, and at the school talent show, I saw this, our dance band, our school dance band, you know, playing. And I thought, wow, that looks really great. And I took some drum lessons, um, you know, through the school music program. We actually had wonderful school music programs in those days. And I wanted a drum set and my parents flatly refused. I have three other siblings who all played instruments. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back, I guess. And we uh, argued about it for a while. One day I came home from school and there was this banjo on my bed. And I knew it was a bribe as soon as I saw it and that I'd never get my drums. And I was like, OK. But what <laughs> happened was that um, the, there was a lady who had put an ad in our, in our neighborhood uh, local paper to teach banjo and I had never met a grown-up woman in the arts before she was a professional and uh, she was so awesome I decided I was loved taking banjo lessons because I liked hanging out with her that was Patty Fisher and I think in those slides you had a quick uh, a photo of her uh, at the World's Fair in the 1960s uh, playing on stage and I didn't know till many, many years later how completely bizarre it was uh, for there to be a woman professional four-string banjoist uh, because they were indeed very rare and uh, have been rare up till very recently. Uh, so that's my story. <laughs> yeah, I fell you. in love with the banjo eventually, by the way. <laughs> really <laughs> through jazz, I, I discovered that... Um, well, Patty introduced me to, uh, to jazz, and I started working and playing some gigs. I discovered I could make money with banjo, mm -hmm. paid a lot better than babysitting or flipping hamburgers, you know, <laughs> or whatever, you know, jobs were available to me as a teenager. And, um, you know, that was really cool, and it, it was a while before I made the jazz connection, uh, but that's when I really realized you know, I, I really like this. Uh, yeah. Before it was more for fun, money, fun, adventure, and okay, I'll do it, why not? Until I thought I was going to continue school, but I never did. Stayed with this. <laughs> nice. Well, we're glad you did. And, and, and what was about, you know, the early jazz that kind of drew you into that music to really kind of dig deep into that, into it? What part of early jazz? Um, just, just what was it about the music that that really drew you in? Was there something specific? Well, really, I just, I just really liked that. Um, there, I liked the groove. I yeah. like the kind of. There's a rawness and an honesty and a bottom line swing about it that I liked. Uh, there's something just. I don't know. I found it earthy and freeing and exciting uh, all mm -hmm. at the same time. And uh, I just and I connected to it. Yeah. And you've you've always you know, you're you're well versed in, in, in playing in playing traditional jazz. But then you've also brought the four string banjo into kind of some other territory as well, yeah. playing, um, which has always been interesting to me. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of um, are there? What gave you the freedom to to feel like you could you know bring it outside of the general kind of mold of where it traditionally is? And also, are there specific styles of music that work well on the four string banjo? You think? Well, to answer the first part of your question, I would say that I just felt 
when I was a, as a band leader, I basically thought, well, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> That's one of the advantages of, of uh, you know, of that. I love being a side player also, but I didn't see any reason to restrict myself to uh, traditional jazz. I, I feel like that's where I was schooled and, and that's where I'm, my style is rooted from that. But I, for, for years and years, I've just decided to play any song that I liked. And, uh, and I'll put my jazz spin on it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, uh, and usually it's an early jazz spin because that's, you know, where I'm rooted. But um, I think there's lots of music out there that, that connects to go to the second part of your question, um, rock and roll, for example, um, classic, you know, style rock, uh, certainly country, you know, old time cowboy things. Um, and um, I love tango music. I, I, I do quite a bit of that. I also love playing classical music on the banjo. And um, it's not really the instrument. It's not designed for that. There's a whole field of classic banjo, uh, where mm -hmm. there's actually music written for uh, a finger picking style. And I just like adapting uh, music that I like and and playing it <laughs> cool that's this is great that you never had the you know the barriers the you know, these these imaginary barriers that we can sometimes put on ourselves well i think i started with them because mm -hmm. i i heard the musicians around me and uh and i would see the there were very specific arenas of goals and and things you know and and i respect those i mean if i'm gonna play in a band that's a true traditional jazz band, I, I, I'm very conscientious about working with that style and that sound. And I completely love that too. Or New mm -hmm. Orleans, you know, sound. I mean, I, I, I love, I guess one of the things I love is the variety. And so I love playing with a real trad band and I love swinging out and doing a little out of the box for my genre as really just as much. So. Uh, it also depends very much on the musicians that I'm working with. And I like to use people who are um, very comfortable and have career established careers in multi genres. And to me, they bring me, they help me go to other places. And I find that mm -hmm. very exciting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, if you can quickly, the differences in between, because there's another four string banjo and a lot of people get these confused, you know, that there's the tenor banjo, which is a shorter neck. Without getting into the differences of the scale length and the tuning, um, what do you think, how would you compare them in their strengths and their weaknesses between the two? And why should yeah. somebody, if they want to get into playing four string banjo, why, which way would you direct them? You're, you play the plectrum, so you might lean that way, but is there, is there, because can you kind of... How would you direct you, somebody you on that are, question? I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I think I'm going to put on my headphones because these things okay. are starting to cut in and out and I could get about half or two thirds of what you said. Sure. I'll do this very quickly. I knew this might happen. <laughs> no problem. So I'm ready. Um, let's see. And um, I think I think you were asking me about tenor versus plectrum. Is that correct? Yes. If you could talk about the strengths uh -oh. and the weaknesses. for Now I don't you... hear you at all. Oh, dear. I'm going to try to go me? back to those earbuds because now Listen. I completely don't hear you. Yeah, let's go back to the earbuds. Anyway, was you can put a thumb up if I have yeah. the... <laughs> <laughs> if I have the just correctly. Correct question. Okay, well, you know, it, it, there's an there's an interesting history about uh, plectrum versus tenor, and and I'm amazed at um, how how many. Um, Number one, jazz musicians don't know that the banjo is the original fretted instrument of jazz, and I'm also amazed that um, the um, that often banjo players are not familiar with our broad spectrum banjo world uh, with so many different styles. The, the, the tenor banjo is typically 
widely associated as the jazz banjo, and the plectrum banjo is is uh, more widely associated with um, vaudeville and showbiz and and theater kind of stuff, and. Um, in reality, both do both. There are plenty of historic examples of both doing both. And uh, we were talking, you know, during the sound check very, very briefly about uh, one of the huge banjo stars of the past named Eddie Peabody. And I kind of, <laughs> I don't know if this is historically accurate, but I kind of blame Eddie Peabody because he was so famous that uh, his, his very theatrical, flashy vaudeville style kind of overshadowed a lot of the other styles <laughs> like out there. And I don't even know if that's true, but, but to this day, there is a more theatrical association with, with the uh, longer neck plectrum and the more jazz association with the tenor. But in reality, uh, to me, there is zero uh, difference. Both do both. And there are different tunings. Uh, the tenor is tuned and pitched like a, a viola. And uh, the five string is uh, very similar, a close first cousin to the five string without that fifth string. And um, I don't play, I don't think autom automatically enough on tenor to, to perform with it. Uh, so um, to me, there's no musical boundary, even though there is a slightly different musical identity, at least historically, between the two. Yeah, yeah. Well. You know, congratulations very much uh, on the award. Well, very well deserved. Um, would you like to play another tune for us? I am really sorry. I lost all of that. <laughs> this is this is losing play? losing quickly. <laughs> you want you me to play? play it too? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I'm happy to play <laughs> another tune. Okay. Ah, uh, I just, uh, this is, I just love digital life. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, what, I'll do, um, I was kind of on the fence about uh, something kind of bright or something kind of pretty. I'm more in a prettier style of mood. So let's do um, Stardust, uh, my mom's favorite song written by the great Hoagy Carmichael. Thank you. 
beautiful, beautiful. Well, I congratulations. Don't know if you saw both of my my earbuds fell out. <laughs> well, <laughs> beautiful playing. I'd you love can to hold bring up a sign <laughs> or put yeah. something in chat. <laughs> I'm going to bring Jamie and, and Allison back in and uh this, that was great playing. Great to hear Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> You're muted, Jamie, as well. Just, just digital problematicness. <laughs> What's happening? Cynthia, I know you can't hear us, but thank you. Thank you very much. And a huge congratulations uh, from everybody here. Yep. Bravo. <laughs> thank you. I, I see your, your, your hand motions and thank you very much. I, I'm, I, you know, I assume you can hear me and I just want to say, um, I'm honored, thrilled, um, every word under the sun. I, I'm so appreciative of, of this honor. I take it very seriously. I, uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's exciting. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart and, uh, I'll do my best to keep getting the four string banjo out there. And I appreciate your acknowledgement. So thank you so very much. That was awesome. Cynthia, that was fantastic. <laughs> I love those chord melodies too. That's just so great and so relatable, really. Yeah, absolutely. Really They're amazing. They're amazing. Uh, she, she was such a good uh, spot. I mean, she coped very well with it, with the technical difficulties there as well. But mm -hmm. um all kinds of stuff happening now. I've got fire alarms in the background. It's it's fantastic. Oh, is that what's so, going on? I was wondering yeah. about that. Yeah, I'll do all that in just a second. All right. So uh, Dave ducked out for a minute, but um, so Cynthia Sayer is the winner number one. Uh, winner number two, Addison Brown. Yes. Is, is a is a is a friend of all of ours. Um, so Terry Bockham. and uh, I think let's just jump straight into the video from here because that, I think, says everything best. Terry Bauckham was one of the five-string banjo's most beloved sons. With one of the best right hands in the business, unrivaled tone, and the stunning constancy of his timing, Terry earned the nickname the Duke of Drive, and his style was a tremendous influence on a generation of banjo players. Terry was born in Monroe, North Carolina in 1952 and started playing banjo when he was 10. He grew up surrounded by music. Terry's grandfather was a clawhammer banjo player and his father was a devout fan of Bill Monroe. Like so many others, he was first captivated by the banjo when he heard Earl Scruggs on the Beverly Hillbillies. When I heard that banjo, he said, it really hit me and I have not been the same since. He told his father he had to have a banjo for Christmas and began playing soon after that. While Terry was a devout student of Earl Scruggs and J.D. Crow, he developed a very personal, traditionally rooted style with a unique sonic signature, the Bauckham sound. Clean, clear, driving, and full of tone. Over the past 50 years, he played with some of the most influential musicians in bluegrass and co-founded bands that helped to define the possibilities for bluegrass music. In 1975, he co-founded Boone Creek with Ricky Skaggs and Jerry Douglas. In 1979, he became a founding member of Doyle Lawson and Quicksilver, and in the early 90s, he founded Third Time Out. He also toured and performed with Tony Rice, Mountain Heart, Blue Ridge, and Lou Reed in Carolina. In 2023, Terry received the Distinguished Achievement Award from the International Bluegrass Music Association for his contributions to the furtherance of bluegrass music. He is also a member of the Blue Ridge Music Hall of Fame and was known as a mentor to aspiring musicians. Despite the accolades, Terry always remained amazingly humble for someone who left such an indelible mark on the banjo. We're proud to award Terry Bauckham, the Duke of Drive, this year's Steve Martin Banjo Prize. And what a deserved winner. Um, so appropriate uh winner of the, the uh, uh distinguished music award earlier this year at ibma um and uh was honored there as well um now as steve mentioned uh, at the top of the show in his video terry very sadly passed away on december 7th uh following a very brief but uh, debilitating illness um and uh, that was just days after he received word that he uh, was going to receive this award um 
and Steve also mentioned uh, that we understand that he was aware and he acknowledged it and by all accounts, uh, very happy and, and uh, grateful, I think, to have uh, received it. And I think we're all very happy that he mm -hmm. was able to express that and acknowledge that uh, before his passing as well. Yeah, it's definitely a very bittersweet, but his playing touched so many of us in the banjo community. And I really think the shape of what it means to play three finger bluegrass style banjo would be really different if it hadn't been for all the great playing that Terry did and all the great, you know, inspiration he gave to all of us. So it's very bittersweet, but it's it's comforting to know that he was able to take that little bit of love from all of us with him. Absolutely. And uh, all of our thoughts and prayers are out with uh, with Cindy and the family as well, obviously, at this time. Um, Dave, uh, you knew Terry a little bit. I think we've all, I mean, he played our banjos for uh, 11, 12 years, something along those lines. Yeah. So we've all had the opportunity to, to interact uh, with him. What are, what are some of your memories? I mean, just before I knew him, just so influential. I think I, I first knew about him when he was playing with Doyle Lawson is when I, and, uh, you know, and just, uh, just that his, his rhythm and time and, and just mm -hmm. tone that you get is just always so influential. And then when I got to, when I started working with Deering, uh, um, and started working with us, it was getting to know him, just a, just a, a great guy. And, uh, you know, it's always being at Earl Fest and seeing him is always, always one of the highlights. Yeah, absolutely. It was the smile for me. I was trying to think of a word uh, that Americans would use for the word cheeky. I would say in England, it was a, it was a cheeky smile. Like he was always, there was always like a slight hint of mischievousness, not malicious, but just fun, playful smile. And he had that kind of that thing going all the time. And that, that always made me smile whenever I saw him. It was, uh, it was always great. And the fact that they, they would always come up and make a point of, of hanging with us at events. Um, and it was never mm -hmm. business related. Right. It was genuinely because they wanted to come say hi and just how the kids, how's the family. Um, you know, it was, it was rarely, if ever, actually about the business side of things, which was always refreshing. You know, it was just a relationship and that was, that was always great. Yeah. So we do have a little clip that I'm going to play before we bring in our guests. Uh, now, <laughs> it's a good clip, though. This is, a, as, as the video just, just mentioned, Terry was one of the founding members of Boone Creek. Um, and there is a few videos, and I want to uh, throw a quick shout out to uh, Tom Adler on YouTube, otherwise known as uh, Banjo Chief. Uh, and he's been posting videos here and there of, uh, of a particular 1977 performance by Boone Creek at Diner's Playhouse in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, there's a very good video um, uh, out there as well, a number of them, but he's slowly kind of, I guess, putting them all out. And he very kindly sent me the whole performance. Um, so we put together just a, a little clip uh, and let's see if you can recognize the guy right at the end. Over here on the banjo, he'll be playing some fiddle after a while and a little bit of mandolin too. Sings real good bass and baritone. Really a fine fella too, from Monroe, North Carolina. Give Terry Balkum a big hand, would you? recognize him <laughs> yeah. to uh let's let's talk about terry a little bit and uh who better uh to bring in than uh terry's longtime bandmate friend 
uh, compadre, and uh, I guess road warrior at arms is Mr. Jerry Douglas. Let's bring him in. <laughs> hey, Jerry, how are you? I'm great. Uh, yeah, that brought back a few memories. I think I know what Ricky was saying to the bass player there. <laughs> oh, you, is that something you, you need to yeah. share with the class here? It's something you couldn't say on TV. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that was the band. You know, we were we were all in our early 20s. Uh, I was 20 years old. Falcon was, um, Terry was two years older than me. Uh, but we didn't know what we were doing. We were just, we just loved playing music and we wanted to play together. Uh, Ricky and I had sort of handpicked this band to be Boone Creek. And it was, and Terry Balcom was the first guy we went and asked to be part of this band. And he was a fiddle player at the time for a guy named Charlie Moore, who was a big, he was a big star on the bluegrass circuit. And uh, I remember meeting Terry down in Orange, Virginia at some hot, really hot bluegrass festival everybody was sweating you know and, and uh, it was a funny place to be but uh just knowing knowing him from then on through the years it just was just one of the most hilarious people you would ever meet it was a really really funny guy and had his own vernacular for you know describing things he had his own his own uh vo vocabulary uh if he if he loved something, he would say, "That can see. That's it can see. It's got eyes. It can see." You know, <laughs> he'd hold his hand like this, and and, and uh, but he, everything he said was hilarious. I mean, everything he said, and I I had the good fortune of being roommates with him early on in the band, and uh, and I told Allison a few things the other day that that you know we just just. <laughs> talking about terry you know and um what a great guy he was and what he was not a competitive guy you know how banjo players can become competitive anybody on any instrument can become competitive uh terry was not that way he <clears throat> he went to school on earl scruggs bill emerson jd crow and he stuck to that you know and he he really was the guy if you wanted to know how to play the banjo and walk through a brick wall at the same time. Terry Balkum was the guy <laughs> you to talk to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I miss him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna really miss him. I, uh, I loved him. And uh, we were, like I said, we were all just little kids, and we put this band together. But the sound of the band has carried on through, uh, especially the sound of Terry Balkum's banjo, which was the most important thing in our sound, is that we were. Uh, I described, tried, tried to describe it in the, in our networking, you know, to, of what it was like. Uh, we were, we were playing bluegrass songs, but we were trying to, we were, we were, we were living in a definite uh, hair rock kind of uh, time. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so we carried a little bit of all of that into the bluegrass music world, you know, and I've done as much as anybody in the world to, change bluegrass try to tear it apart and start all over again you know but now i've got this band called the earls of lester that is just everything but it's just if it's not bluegrass music then you don't know what bluegrass music is you know it's it, it's my repentance uh, for all <laughs> I did during boot break <laughs> but uh terry was terry was the supposed to be the fiddle player but the banjo player was down for the count when it came down to really committing. So Terry said to one of us, uh, he said, I, th I remember I played some banjo when I was about 10 years old. I'll try it, you know? So we got him some picks and he, he borrowed a banjo from a fellow, uh, Harry Sparks, a friend of ours. And I think it was an RB three. And he, he just, you know, within 15 minutes of putting his picks on and fooling around with a little bit, he sounded like Terry Balkum does now. I mean, he sounded, <laughs> He, he had this sound. He just, you know, we all carry a sound around with us. And whatever we play, we try to reproduce that sound. And Falcom definitely was a banjo player because he he set uh, he set a bar, a, re a very high bar for other for other banjo players to follow in his footsteps and play that particular kind of music that way. And uh, next came Dole Lawson 
and then you know third time out and all these other bands do finally to the dukes of drive somebody who could take on his his title you know and and become that band that uh, represented what he was all about and i think he did that well and uh I saw him at Merle Fest this past year in April, end of April, and he was doing pretty good. But then we got the diagnosis of, you know, a pretty heavy, heavy thing, and he was going to have to go through. And uh, and I, I almost fortunately, it's over now. The battle is over, and Terry's better and and not dealing with this thing anymore. And and that it was all we all just got came around. You know, everybody wanted to be part of his his journey, you know, uh, going on out. But this, to win this award at this time in his life, which is totally, you know, it should happen. I mean, it's it's all totally right. And the timing of it couldn't be any better. And for him to feel, you know, like he was really part of the banjo community, and I know he loved all the people at Daring, and talked about all you know you need to hear flux you need to hear this banjo it will blow trees down you know <laughs> like that you know it's like but it, it uh, he was just a wonderful guy and everybody needs to know that and and this uh this award is just you know sort of proof of sticking to your guns and and uh playing what you know and playing it the best of anybody possible is uh it, it pays off. It really does to your peers and all the people out there that listen to you and are, and are, are uh, eventually, you know, trying to play the banjo like you because you sound like that. You know, I want to sound like that. And I think we've all been through that at some point on our instruments. But uh, Terry Balcom was a special, special, uh, special man, uh, breathing rare air. I think that he was... Uh, he was one of the best banjo players we'll ever see and the most steady and rock rock solid and yeah walk right through a brick wall with a banjo yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh so so you know his, his nickname is the duke of drive what's it like playing with somebody that has that sort of sense of rhythm and what's that what's that drive mean you know in in bluegrass it's relentless and you need that you need that in a bluegrass band you know if you were really going to be like a hard a hard hard pounding you know kind of like play you know when you play bugle call rag or you play one of those tunes you know one of those old earl tunes you, you really have to commit you have to commit your body and soul to what you're about to do and Bauckham was ready and he had one thought of just delivering that you know, delivering that sound to everybody and, and through his own conduit, you know, through his head, through his hands to the banjo. And, and it was always a, a just, I never heard the guy make a mistake. <laughs> and it was just, you know, it drove the rest of us crazy because we're messing up all over the place. But Bach was like, well, just follow him, you know, wherever he goes, go there and we'll be okay. Did, did you find that even though you're you're not playing a banjo, did did he kind of drive you to be a better musician in certain respects, just because of that? Oh, totally. Um, you know, he he had the same thing that J.D. Crow kind of had the placement mm -hmm. of the notes and where where he would start a solo. You know, with, he wouldn't play a he wouldn't play a lead into a solo. It was just kapow. Here it is. This is the first downbeat of the of the solo was he didn't play, he didn't lead into it. It was just bang one. Yeah. And it's, it's beginning. And here we go on this big wild ride of Balkum. And, uh, he made me a better musician. He did. He, 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 I took from him. I took this hard driving idea of, uh, of just being, you know, when you play your solo like it's the last one you're ever going to get to play, you know, that I think that's pretty much how he looked at things. And uh, he was going to play that solo to the best of his ability. It was like the last one he was anybody was ever going to hear. He was going to play it. He was going to play it right. And he was yeah. going to be happy with it when it was over. Yeah, he, he talks about um, 
you know, drive a lot. And actually, we do have a clip lined up, which we didn't really have a spot for, but I think now's a good time. But uh, I'm curious. Uh, we asked him as when good he, as that last one you had. Uh, well, it's, a, it's a more recent one. It's when um, Cindy and him came on uh, oh. to hearing live. And we asked the question. Well, actually, uh, a, a regular viewer, Joseph Pusk, asked the question, um, can you define what drive is? And yeah. Let's play the video and we'll, we'll get the uh, we'll get the quick chit chat. All right, you got music here going down the road, and you got one guy in the middle. You got one guy kind of hanging back, and that one guy be almost speeding. He he is the one that's got the drive. The other two guys are going the wrong way. <laughs> He's he is the man that with the drive, and it's just something you feel, and you know. If you play with the band a lot, you you get good at doing little things that really help the, the speed of it. You're almost rushing the song, but you pull it back just enough. I know it's difficult. Playing on top of the beat. Yeah, or on giving top it, of the beat. Keeping yeah. it just a little bit not of a push. Not in the push. middle, not behind, right on top of it. So. But don't you also think a slow song can have drive? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's not all about speed. It's more about feel. Yeah, it's hard to. Uh, it's hard to explain, but if you feel it, <laughs> would it if you would, feel it, you know you've got it. Uh, it. It would be kind of similar to like swing and jazz, you know, a similar sort of. It's a it's a feel of the of the rhythm. It, it is a feel, um, and it's not about bearing down and playing hard or fast, but like Terry said, pushing it a bit. On top of the beat. Yeah, just look at Earl. Or anything he plays, if you listen to him, he is leading that band and he is almost rushing, but he's not rushing. He, he <laughs> holds it down. To, he don't go past the, you know, he don't get a ticket for speed, man. That's, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. I've also heard you say drive is your best friend. Timing is your best Timing friend. Timing is your drive best friend. Drive is everything. <laughs> But the other one is the best there you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was talking with, with Allison about this the other day. Is that when Earl Scruggs would play, uh, it was like he was leaning out, looking over the cliff, over the precipice, you know, and, and the band stayed right here. You know, the uh -huh. band Earl was like right here, and it, the whole thing moved like that, you know, or I'm going the wrong way. But, uh, it was like hydroplaning in your car when you're on the water, when you, when suddenly you're not in control anymore, you know, and something's lifted you up and it's moving you along. That's what it felt like to me when I first discovered what Earl Scruggs, what he was doing was he was getting out on top of the band and he wasn't rushing. He just got, he just took a one half step out in front of the band and stayed there. And just looked over the edge and kind of like every you know here we go and it was exciting it was re that's what made their banjo his banjo playing so exciting and balkum tapped into that he knew exactly what he was doing yeah that's 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 something that not every banjo player can pull off balkum could do that yeah Allison, you, you spent a lot of time with uh, with terry also um well over not as years. much as not as much in person as just like consuming recordings. And um, when I was about fifteen or sixteen, Stuart Duncan and I got a, a copy of a, a a bootleg of a show you guys did in Cement, Oklahoma, <laughs> Boone Creek, <laughs> and we just I we wore the coating off the tape. We listened to that, <laughs> but just what you're talking about, and and two like. Uh, I associate Terry's playing with a lot of those bluesy licks that are just so good. Like there was a kind of a bluesy banjo thing that was happening in the seventies. That was not a good thing, <laughs> but when, but in Terry's hands <laughs> later on, you know, it, it no just, uh, a lot of those licks are just so perfect when Terry plays them. And I think it's a combination of those blue notes, plus that really su such centered time that makes it so tasteful. And mm -hmm. there's no, no doubt that it's tasteful and appropriate to do. And it bends your ear just a little bit, but it's so in the pocket. It's just uh, really remarkable. He grew up in, in, a, in 
a part of North Carolina where banjo players are everywhere. And so he, I imagine he heard a lot of good banjo players as he was growing up, but he was, he was thinking about being a fiddle player, you know, after, after he'd played the banjo for a while, he was, he was thinking more about being a fiddle player, but he carried it with him. He still had it inside him. He still had the, the drive. It was his secret weapon. Mm -hmm. And he knew, he knew how to, you know, pull the band up out of the ditch, you know, you know, if he felt the felt, if he felt you lag in the least, he poured on the cold just a little bit more, you know, just to pull you along and set things back in the groove. And he was the groove. You followed him. Yeah. The bass player followed him. Do you think there's any connection between the fact that he and Earl were both from North Carolina? Like you're, you're coming to it from Ohio and, and, and as somebody who grew up playing bluegrass in California, the groove is completely different on the There's West There's something Coast. in the water there. There's something in the water, you know, all those great banjo players coming from Mark Pruitt, you know, and, and, and Balkum and, and uh, Snuffy Jenkins, and, you know, it goes on back. I mean, if banjo was just the way of life, banjo was something you needed a banjo or your band wasn't complete. And uh, they all played on the front porch, you know, and then they took it to the to the auditoriums and played it. But yeah, Bauckham, uh I think there's something in the water, and there's just a there's just a hereditary line, a thread in there somewhere of, of that part of North Carolina, Western North Carolina, just pumped out the great banjo players. And Terry Bach was certainly one of them. Absolutely. Did, yeah. did he play? I'm trying to remember because I, I got that entire performance, that one hour performance from of the Boone Creek show, and I I, <laughs> I need to go back and check. But I in, in in memory serves, he plays fiddle that night, and maybe I'm incorrect on that. But did he uh, continue to play fiddle live, or did kind of banjo just take the the lead, as it were, from that point? He on? did continue to play fiddle. I mean, we we did things where at one point Vince Gill was in the band too. Whoa. And so Ricky being a fiddle player and Terry being a fiddle player and, and, and Vince wanting to be a fiddle player, <laughs> he got to be the sandwich. He had the pros on the outside of him, you know, keep him in line. But, um, but we'd have three part fiddles, you know, on, on Don uh, Bob Wills tunes or whatever, you know, there's one, I think it's dark as a night maybe on there. It was a song that we played a lot and that had double fiddles on it. Nice. So that may be one what he that he played on that wasn't so banjoistic. Sure. Uh, that he, we could let him escape to the fiddle for that one, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Do you remember much about that show? I do. I I remember uh, just doing the show, and I just remember Ricky and I running out like two hours before the show to buy clothes to wear on it because we, ah. <laughs> we were a young man we didn't have clothes like that we had to go out and buy brand new clothes we want to look good on tv you know? <laughs> so, uh, we're looking pretty sharp we're going. Going. my pants were about a foot too long and, and, uh, <laughs> my pants and, and uh, you know we were all like trying to you know our shirts were itching you know so so it was uh <laughs> <laughs> I just walk him, but you could tell from the introduction when he just kind of they introduce him. He looks at the camera for a second, and it's like, ah, yeah. You know, he, well, he, that's what struck me as well. Like, he's I not think that kind of guy. Yeah, he 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 didn't. I don't want to say he didn't like the limelight by any means because he, he made a career out of it. But his general kind of disposition when they kind of introduced him, when Ricky introduces him. Yeah. He's not like, ah, look at me. Like, he was he's way very too just, cool for that. Just, just let me play my, my banjo and leave me yeah. alone. And, I'll and do whatever he did, Wes Golding would do the same thing. He's <laughs> like, they were they were twins. I mean, it it was it was amazing. Uh, they started to sound the same. You know, it started. To, <laughs> and Vince Gill lived in their apartment too. Uh, we we all lived in an apartment complex in Lexington. All the whole band in this one apartment <laughs> complex, uh, Larkin Terrace String String Company. You know those Larkin Terrace singers. There were all kinds of things that we put on the backs of our records, and, and we've just found uh, four new cuts, lost cuts of the of Boone Creek, that uh, 
when we finished recording, the engineer ran off with the tapes. <laughs> they just and they just found them like last year or year before, oh. and have cleaned them up. And there are four new tracks that I hadn't heard since 1976 or seven. Wow! Wow! But we were we were actually uh, in the running with RSO Records when they first started, and. Uh, uh, Spencer Davis came to Lexington, Kentucky to see us thinking we were, uh, we were like a, an alternative rock band, but we were playing on the back on, on, a, on a flatbed truck for a food town opening that day as a bluegrass band. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we had a meeting at the pizza hut next door and we never saw Spencer Davis again, oh, man. Uh, but they signed Kansas instead of us. So they did all right. <laughs> Good choice. Good choice yeah. uh, I'm not sure. I'm not necessarily convinced of that, but <laughs> <laughs> well, if you'd have heard us and Kansas at the same time, yeah, you would pick that. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying though. We were we were really, you know, we were we did everything but tease our hair way up. We and a couple of guys did that, tried that out too. But we tried everything. You did it all. Jerry, what, what, is, what does Terry mean to you? And, you know, if he was with us today, you know, what, what would you say to him uh, in, in recognition of, the, of this award? Oh, I, a deep one. I would tell him that I loved him and, and that, uh, you know, that he'd been in, important to me, you know, and, and important to my career, to my life, you know, just knowing him and, and, uh, and to so many banjo players, I mean, coming from a place where he had no idea he was going to be a banjo player again. And then suddenly he was thrust into it and he just honed it and worked on it and became Terry Bauckham, you know, this, the Bach, you know, and it was like a style of banjo. You played Terry Bauckham style banjo. It was no longer, oh, this is Crow style banjo, or it was a combination of things. So, it was called Balk Balkum, but it but it was uh, he's helped you know he's just reinformed and the the instrument a little bit I think and and reeducated a lot of people about what that banjo can do uh, in in a situation like that. I mean, it was situational for him to become a banjo player. He he had no idea he was going to be one until he was thrust into it, and it was the place for him to be obviously i mean yeah. to go on and to win an award like this when there's so many people out there that you know are deserving of this award but it's tone it, it's terry's turn it's terry's yeah. turn and he's earned it and he's and it's and it's it's timely uh and it's just it's all perfect it's all perfect and it's the greatest way to to send our our buddy off you know in uh in glorification like this and uh, to give him a, an award from his peers and from all the, from Steve Martin, from Allison and, and all those people to, I think t Terry would be, he'd be so proud. He'd be beaming. He'd be so happy right now as he was when he was told the Cindy mm -hmm. told. Him. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just great. And, and there'll never be another fellow like that. I mean, I have so many great memories of, of, hanging out with him, being with him, you know, going through things with him. And, and, uh, he was a very, he was a great human being, Terry Bauckham, just to give you the shirt off his back, the banjo off his, his right shoulder. And, uh, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he was one of those guys, he put it on the right shoulder. He, he, he'd throw it, he'd throw it in there. I mean, and, uh, I don't know how they do that. Yeah, it really hurts. <laughs> but it's a lot of weight on one side. But that's that was it. I mean, Earl did it. JD did it. Balkum did it, and yeah. it works. Evidently, it's a, it's a good place to wear the banjo. <laughs> pretty pretty appropriate to uh, to mention him in that company. I think. Absolutely. I think so. Yeah. yeah definitely. Absolutely. Allison, any final uh, final thoughts as we kind of slowly wind this down? Well, I mean, if Terry were here, I would just have to give him a big thank you for everything that he's given to me as a musician and, and of course, to the banjo as a whole. And, you know, the way he took kind of the traditional roots of three-finger style and applied it to music that was more contemporary in bluegrass that attracted mm -hmm. me when I was a teenager and continued to, you know, it spoke to me in a different way than 
old Lester Flat, Earl Scruggs and the Foggy Mountain Boys. I mean, when Terry played, it had a modern drive to it and a modern sensibility to it that made it really resonate. And I think that that's a lot of the power. It's fascinating, too, to to be really a traditionalist in your approach, but yet um, have a modern aesthetic at the same time. And uh, that's that's how Terry's playing was for me. Just yeah, it's like you just can't get enough of banjo when it sounds like that too. It's just the best. Yeah, yeah. Dave, you got some final thoughts? I can see it. No, it's, I mean it's, 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 <laughs> many of the words that have been said. The same, the same thing. I just you know, give them a huge congrats. It's so well deserved. And and uh, I also want to say, you know, thanks Jerry for for coming on the show and sharing oh. all all the stories and the memories. My pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. I'd love, I'd love to Rest do more. Please, Terry Balcom. Yeah, absolutely. I got a we when we put the we found out the other day and we we sent an email out internally and uh, uh, I'll I'll read it because I think it's it's very poignant. But Greg Deering's response to that email um, was him finding out and he said, "I don't know what to say. I'm shocked." Terry was one of the few who truly made the world a better place, and the world seemed like a place where we would always have Terry. It will take a lot to adjust to the world without him. And I'll miss him greatly. So I think that I thought that was really nice. And uh, he's uh, he was a good man, a really, really good man. And and I think one of the things just to kind of wrap up was well, the clip that we played with him and Cindy uh, was I, I liked it because it was them. It was it was Cindy and Terry together, and and the rapport that they had as kind of you know, obviously husband and wife, but also kind of the business element. And they just had this connection, you know, yeah, and they just laugh. And, yeah. Yeah. And it she was very apparent, yeah. even for somebody like me who didn't really know them uh, nowhere near as well as, as someone like both of you guys or all you guys. So it was obvious. Yeah. Awesome yeah. stuff. Yeah. Great, great man. Very much so. Very much so. Well, it's been a long show. Jerry Douglas, please, thank you so much for coming. You're up in San Francisco, which uh, I believe this is your last stop before you head home for a little while. I have, I have one more after 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 this one, but it's ah. it's a great tour. Tommy Emanuel, somebody, is just amazing. I've never seen anybody. I've played with some great guitar players, but wow. <laughs> He's yeah. something yeah. else. He's something else. And then just, just very quickly, because I think it's worth mentioning, uh, and we'll try and promote it as well. It's Earl's birthday in January, and That's you are right. putting together a bit of a show. Let's just very quickly talk about that, because I think it's it's very poignant uh, as we close the show out. Well, yeah, a, a couple of years ago, uh, my manager and I were talking, and he said, you know what would be cool? And I said, what? And he said, if we booked the Ryman for Earl's birthday, it was 100th birthday. And I said, do it now. <laughs> and so he did, he booked it and we didn't really do anything for a year and you kind of just watch the upheaval of everything. And January 6th, you know, being Earl's birthday, I thought we need to take that back. And uh, so let's have a big old birthday party, 100th birthday party for Earl Scruggs in the Ryman, the place that where he made hit so much history and, and get banjo players like Allison Brown and Bela Fleck and Tony Trishka and Jim Mills and uh, you know just just oh man it's just it's explosive if you're a banjo player there would be no place else I would want to be uh, instead of that room that night because it's just going to fill up with banjo goodness you know banjo goodness yeah. it's, it's going to be great it's going to be it's well represented by everybody and uh and we're going to go through the whole the whole gamut of his whole career from from his brother Horace and he, you know, yeah. they used to do this thing where they would they would start playing on the porch when they thought they were good enough to do this. They start playing on the porch and then they'd walk in opposite directions around and meet in the back of the house and see if they were still playing in time with each other. <laughs> That's brilliant. You know, so I don't know if it worked or not, but um, it just it's just a big celebration it's all about earl scruggs to me and i just kind of happened to be put in this position so i started calling people and nelson was one of the first people i called I and, uh, uh, well, I can't wait thank you for for asking me jerry that's going to be it's going to be epic Truly. i think so too i think it's going to be great and we're almost sold out so people close in on it when you can while you can because uh 
all the money is going to go towards the Earl Scruggs Foundation up there in, in North Carolina. Wonderful. And uh, oh. I, be, I believe in paying all these things forward. And I think everybody that's there that night will agree with me on, mm -hmm. the, you know, and continuing Earl Scruggs legacy and, and in that Terry Balkum's legacy as well. Right. We should start yeah. planning now for Terry's hundredth, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just get that build up. <laughs> yeah. We got 30 years to yeah. plan this thing. We got it. <laughs> we got this. It's going to be fine. <laughs> Awesome. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us tonight Bye. and uh, good luck with the rest of the tour and, and with the show and uh, we'll plug it as much as we can. All right. All right. All right. Well, that How was one of the history books. That was, that was that great. Was, that was yeah. Great. It was, it was, it was good to reminisce. Lots of very positive comments in the chat of people just saying, thank you for great, the conversation for, for the memories and all that kind of stuff. So, um, that was that was a that was a good one. I enjoyed that, and uh, I thought Cynthia was fantastic. I am curious what would have happened if her parents had bought her a drum kit in the first place. <laughs> exactly. I suspect she might still be a banjo player. You think? Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. I mean, a drum is just a banjo without a neck, so right. she would have been half the way there anyway. Right. This is true. <laughs> this is true. I, I'd like to find out. Maybe, maybe it's not too late. Maybe, maybe she played jazz. Maybe she played 80s hair metal. Who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <That'd be great>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, final thoughts. Let's wrap this thing up and uh, let everybody go home. Well, yeah, this was fun. This is great. Um, you know, Cynthia, she, she's such a good player and, uh, and so well deserved. She's done so much for the four string banjo community. And, uh, and then, and then as we, you know, Terry's just, perf you know, the timing is, is very, it's so, so, you know, perfect that it came out and he had a chance to, to, to know about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whenever we get a chance to celebrate people with the Steve Martin Banjo Prize and get to chat with you guys, I, I always realize what a huge heart the banjo community has. And um, it's it's such a privilege to be a part of it. It's such a great instrument. I think it's just so unique in the way it brings people together. And I'm really so glad that the prize is honoring four string and five string banjo and bluegrass and Irish and plectrum and tenor and all the different flavors of banjo. It's just, it's a fantastic community to be a part of. And you guys are great, uh, you know, points on the spear of the banjo community and really grateful to you guys for your support of the prize and everything you do. Thank you for giving us opportunity to do it. It's, it's third year and it's, it's, it's really, really fun. We, we love doing it. So long may it continue. And thank you for everything that you do, Alison, and, and all the, uh, the hard work that you and everybody at Compass have been doing to, to get everything organized. It's, it's, um, it's been great. The video has turned out wonderful. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot left to say. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact, do feel free, post your favorite Terry Bottom songs, memories, stories, stick them in the comments on whatever platform you're watching. And we'd, uh, we'd love to look at that. And who knows, maybe uh, we'll get Jens's uh, uh, thoughts and, and on, on the show next week for the hundredth episode. Um, and we'll read a few of them out as well. So yeah. um, sound good. Sounds great. Well, same time All next right. year, guys. I think Sounds so. Good. Yeah, I mean, you got to give us a bit more hints, though. You know, you can't just leave us hanging like you do with the with who the winners are. Just, just... Well, I'm glad I didn't spoil the surprise. Yeah, you know who's really good at not spoiling the surprise as well is is Jamie Deering because she's on the board. That's she's right. voting, and she's very good at just mm -hmm. she won't she won't tell me nothing. So keep you guessing. But, yeah. All right. Okay. Farewell, everybody. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, David. And uh, we'll see everyone next week. And thank you so, so much for joining us. And uh, congratulations to Cynthia Sayer and to Terry Barker.